The Fukushima nuclear crisis says it was down to the plant's operators being ill-prepared and not responding properly to the quake and tsunami disaster. A major government inquiry said some engineers abandoned the plant as the trouble started and other staff delayed reporting significant radiation leaks. To discuss more on this, I'm joined by Professor Christopher Busby, Scientific Secretary at the European Committee on Radiation Risks. Thanks for joining us. So the report claims operators failed to respond properly, and you said before that the authorities had been lax and slow in handling the situation. To what extent do you feel the assessment's been confirmed by these findings? Well, I think my assessment has been con confirmed 100%, but, but I, I do have to say that I don't think that, uh, that this inquiry has gone far enough because there are lots of questions that they haven't asked and there are lots of questions that still haven't been answered. What are some of those? Well, the, main, the most important one uh, is, has to do with the, um, the health effects of the contamination. Now, that it, it, it's kind of assumed that everybody knows that these health effects are, are not going to be serious. But like, just like I said before, that this was a much more serious incident than anyone had, uh, ha, ha, was suggesting at the time. I'm now saying, or have been saying all along, that the health effects will be very much more serious than anyone is saying now. And I can tell you that there will probably be in some years' time another inquiry which will show also that I am right there. And this is really sad because actually if they did concede that there was a big problem, then people could be, could be moved out and, and other, uh, other activities could take place which would ensure that fewer people got sick than are going to. Why do you think it's taken Japan so long to admit that its response was inadequate? I think that there's an enormous pressure from the nuclear industry and from the people who, who stand to, to lose a lot of money with regard to the, the general uh, nuclear expansion scenario that we've been seeing in the last year or two. I mean, for the, for the nuclear industry, this was an absolute disaster. And it does seem to me from not only the way in which the Japanese have been constrained to handle this uh, this, uh, th th this event, but also the way in which people all over the world are handling this event through the media. I have to say, not Russia today, and I'm very pleased about that. Um, that there does seem to be an, an enormous uh, uh, iron grip on the media with regard to the effects of this, of this terrifying accident, this, this catastrophe. The report also said the government published understated figures on the spread of the radiation. Can that be justified when millions of lives are at risk? Well, of course, that really is a, is a criminal event, as I said before, you know, that, that, that this is criminal irresponsibility because if people had known the extent of the radioactivity, had, had, had the government uh, and, and also, I have to say, the International Atomic Energy Agency come clean with the extent of the contamination, people would have left, people would have got out, and these people who didn't get out will have been seriously contaminated, and this will affect their health. So, so really, this is quite a criminal affair, and I, I would hope that eventually somebody would be brought to justice, or at least there should be some court case about it. Now, Japanese officials claim the plant is now under control, but there have been reports that many Fukushima evacuees remain reluctant to return to their homes. Do you think those concerns are valid? I think that those people should not return to their homes, and I think that it's extremely unlikely that, the, uh, that these reactors are in what they call cold shutdown. I mean, I think this is discourse manipulation. The, 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 uh, very recently, xenon isotopes were being released from those, uh, those plants, and these xenon isotopes have sufficiently short half-lives for us to know that fissioning is still taking place in those reactors. All right, and briefly, what do you think should be done with the Japanese nuclear network now? Well, you know, the Japanese nuclear network was always dangerous. It was always built on the coast in areas where there were tsunamis. It was always built in areas where there were possibly going to be um, uh, earthquakes. And so really, if I were the Japanese people, I would demand that the government close down the entire nuclear operation in Japan and revert to some other form of generating energy. What would that be, do you think? Well, uh, the, uh, there have been studies made that show that, Japanese, Jap that, that Japan is very, very um, rich in, in wind power. And there are lots of ways in which uh, you can get alternative generation of, ele of electricity. But the main problem, of course, is that there's too much electricity being used. We, we, are, we are burning up the planet in order to continue with a lifestyle which is really not sustainable. And I think that is the real answer to all of these questions about nuclear and fossil fuel and all the rest of it. We, we just, we're just burning too much fuel. All right, we have to leave it there. Professor Christopher Busby of the European Committee on Radiation Risks, thanks for your time. Tokyo Electric Power Company says it will use an industrial endoscope to study the inside of a damaged reactor at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. 
The utility says a 10 meter long 8 millimeter wide device will be deployed from next month. It plans to measure temperatures and other conditions inside the containment vessel at the number 2 reactor. The endoscopy will provide the first opportunity to see the inside of a containment vessel at the plant since nuclear fuel melted down in March. The nuclear fuel is believed to have melted through the wall of the pressure vessels and accumulated on the bottom of the containment vessels. The government announced on December 16th that all reactors have been brought under control, but there is little information on the conditions inside the reactor's containment vessels. The government announced on December 16th that all reactors have been brought under control, but there is little information on the conditions inside the reactor's containment vessels. Tokyo prosecutors and police are trying to answer those questions. A face-off is brewing between Fukushima Prefecture and Tokyo Electric Power Company over decommissioning its nuclear plants in the region. Governor Yuhei Sato met with TEPCO President Toshio Nishizawa in Fukushima. It was their first meeting since Nishizawa assumed the president's post in June. Governor Sato explained the prefecture's intention to request all nuclear plants in Fukushima be shut down. He said Fukushima hopes to build a society which doesn't rely on nuclear power. He added that many children have been forced to evacuate their homes since the nuclear accident. The governor urged Nishizawa to think deeply about the current hardship of the Fukushima people. During the meeting, Nishizawa had no comment on the decommissioning issue. Now, the Agriculture Ministry has decided to buy up all the rice in those districts. The ban was imposed after radiation tests showed rice recorded levels above 500 becquerels per kilogram. Since then, the government has tightened its safety standards, lowering the level to 100 becquerels per kilogram. The ministry says it will buy up all the rice in the eight districts, as well as any other crops shown to be contaminated under the new standard. The ministry will ask Tokyo Electric Power Company, the operator of the Fukushima plant, to pick up the bill. It estimates that it will have to buy about 4,000 tons of contaminated rice. Japan's forestry agency has collected cedar cones in Fukushima Prefecture to test for radi radioactive cesium ahead of pollen season. It found that radioactivity from airborne pollen will not pose a health hazard. Cones from 87 locations were collected from the late November to early December. Officials detected extremely high radiation levels of 253,000 becquerels per kilogram in cones from the town of Namie. That's in the no-entry zone, about 11 kilometers from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. 29 other locations saw levels exceed 10,000 becquerels. But the agency says if people are exposed to the pollen of these cones for four months, they would breathe in only about a half a microsievert of radiation. This is really sad because actually if they did concede that there was a big problem, then people could be, could be moved out and, and other, uh, other activities could take place which would ensure that fewer people got sick than are going to. The agency points out that this is only about 10 times what a person would be exposed to from a normal background radiation in central Tokyo. An explosion, a radioactive cloud, serious contamination. It was Sweden that alerted us. Three days after the accident, while Gorbachev is still trying to gather data, American and European spy satellites turn to the Soviet Union and discover the ruins of the Ukrainian plant. The smoke, wafting from the gaping hole, shows up clearly in thermal vision. In the evening of that Monday, the 28th it would be, uh, we had a message from the, Mr. Petrosians, who was the head of Atomic Energy Commission in Russia, uh, in which he told us about the accident. And about the same time, the Russians actually released the information to the world. Obviously, over at the Politburo, we immediately decided it was essential that all facts be reported to us from then on. So I called on the KGB. 
I told them to follow everything that was happening over there and to report the conversations the scientists were having. I told them to report all of that information back to me personally. It has taken over 48 hours to get accurate information about the disaster. Two days during which the 43,000 inhabitants of Pripyat are exposed to contamination. The crisis continues to grow. At the bottom of the destroyed reactor, 1,200 tons of white-hot magma continue to burn at over 3,000 degrees, sending liters of radioactive gas and dust into the atmosphere. The whole of Europe is at the mercy of the winds. crisis, General Antochkin and his fleet of 80 helicopters are sent from Moscow to fight the blaze and put the fire out. When he arrives, the general flies 200 meters above the blown out reactor. Because of the fire, the temperature at that height was between 120 to 180 degrees Celsius. Our dosimeter, the instrument for measuring radiation, only went up to 500 rankins. The needle was going crazy. It was completely off the scale. I think there were at least 1,000 rankins at a height of 200 meters. Even at that altitude, a half hour of exposure could be lethal. The strong current of radioactive hot air streaming up from the reactor makes it impossible to get closer. They will have to improvise some way of carrying out their mission. 